Some people call JavaScript a virus, and if that's true, it means developers are the host. No matter what you label yourself as today, you have to face the reality that one day you may join the hordes of JavaScript developers out there. And when that day comes, you need to be prepared by understanding the practical fundamental concepts of the JavaScript programming language. Today's video is not about victory, it's about survival. Welcome to episode 3 of the full JavaScript course. In the last video, we looked at how JavaScript works under the hood, and today we'll look at many of the fundamental features of the language as they relate to practical programming. But more importantly, I want to help you survive some of the weirder parts of JavaScript that might trip you up or that you might find on an interview question. And many of these concepts, like closures and hoisting, can be easily understood by removing the head or destroying the brain. Chapter 1. Where and how do I run my JavaScript code? Let's find out by creating a Hello World app. Open up an editor like VS Code, create a file called index.js, and type in console log hello world. Now assuming you have Node.js installed, you can run this script directly on your machine via the command line. We'll have an entire video dedicated to Node.js later in the course, but all you need to know for right now is that if you type in node index.js in the command line, it will execute the code in your script. So you just wrote a backend server-side JavaScript application. But when most people think about JS, they're thinking about browsers and web applications. It's possible to run code in the browser, just like we did from the command line, by opening the developer console. In the previous video, we learned that JavaScript has an interpreter, or JIT compiler to be precise, that will execute your code when you type it in here. But the browser console is really just a debugging tool. The way that web applications actually work is they declare a script tag in an HTML document. We can go ahead and create an index.html file, then we'll add a script tag and set the source attribute to the JavaScript file. When the browser parses this HTML file, it's going to see the script tag and then try to load and execute the script. In our case, it won't execute the JavaScript until the document is fully loaded because we use this defer attribute. This is useful because a lot of times your JavaScript will reference HTML elements in the body, which won't be available until the document is fully loaded. Now, the big caveat here is that most developers are using frameworks, which will set up the script tag for you. But if you're doing any kind of web development, it's important to understand how script tags work. But now it's time to move on to chapter two, primitives and objects, which are two of the lowest level building blocks in the language. There is a total of seven primitive types in modern JavaScript, with the most common ones being string, number, boolean, null, and undefined. A special characteristic of primitives is that they're immutable, which means their value can't be directly changed once they've been assigned to a variable. They can be reassigned to a different value, but they just can't be changed directly. And because JavaScript is a dynamic, weakly type language, we don't actually use type annotations in our code, but we can use this type of operator to check a type at runtime if needed. And just for those who are wondering, I'm using the Quokka plugin for VS Code, which displays the output of my code on the right here in blue. We'll look at these data types in more detail as we go through the video, but for right now, you should know the difference between undefined and null. Undefined is the default value that you'll see for a variable that doesn't have a value assigned to it, or for a function that just returns nothing. Null is similar in the sense that it represents an empty value, but it's something that you, the developer, would assign explicitly. Now, these primitive data types can be contrasted with the object type, which represents more complex data structures like arrays, objects, and functions. The big difference is that objects can be seen as a collection of keys and values or properties, and they can be mutated after being assigned to a variable. So the bottom line that you need to understand is that anything that's not a primitive type is going to inherit from object. That includes things like functions, arrays, or any class instances. Now, there's one other little piece of weirdness that you might encounter, and that is primitive wrapper objects. The reason I bring this up is because you may see these out there in the wild and they allow you to basically wrap a primitive type in a class instance, but you should never really use them unless you have a good reason to. Chapter three, control flow and truthy versus falsy. In JavaScript, we can implement conditional logic with an if statement. If a condition is truthy, then we execute this block of code, else we execute this other block of code. And we can also use else if if there are multiple conditions to check. But the more important thing to understand here is what is truthy and what is falsy in JavaScript because JavaScript will always try to coerce a value into a Boolean when it's encountered inside of a conditional statement. True is obviously truthy, and anything that's an object is also truthy, even if it's an empty array or an empty object. The ones you have to watch out for are strings and numbers. A string that has length will be truthy, but an empty string will be falsy. Then the number zero will be falsy, but all other numbers will be truthy. And if you're ever unsure about a value, you can simply add a double bang in front of it to coerce it to a Boolean yourself. Now the reason this works is because the exclamation mark is a logical not operator. A single exclamation mark will return false if a value can be converted to true. So if you add two of them, then it will give you the actual boolean that that value will be coerced to. 
And while we're talking about logical operators, you should also know that a double ampersand is logical and, which ensures that all expressions in the condition will be converted to true. And we also have logical or, which returns true if at least one of the expressions is truthy. Now, another thing you should know is that JavaScript provides two different equality operators. A double equal sign is called an abstract comparison, and it will try to make a type conversion before actually running the comparison. That's pretty weird, so most linters will tell you to never use it. You want answers! I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! In contrast, the strict equality operator will check for equality on both the type and the value, which will give you much more predictable behavior. When it comes to conditional logic, it can get pretty verbose if you use an if statement to define a variable. But you'll commonly see this done with the ternary operator, which gives you a shorthand syntax for defining a variable based on an if-else statement. It has a logical condition on the left side, then a question mark, then the first value is what will be assigned if the condition is truthy, and the second value after the colon is the value if it's falsy. Now before we leave the topic of control flow, it's also worth noting that JavaScript has a switch statement, which allows you to start with an expression and then compare it to multiple cases. And this can be a good alternative to if-else statements if you have a lot of conditions to check. And we can also wrap our code in a try-catch statement, which will attempt to run the code in the try block, but if an error is thrown, then it will move to the catch block. You can try this out yourself by using throw inside of the try block, and then you'll see that it runs the code inside of catch and provides that error that was thrown up above in try. If an error is not thrown, then the code inside of catch will never be run. And you can also add a finally block to the end of all this to run some code after both try and catch have been executed. And finally, a full six and a half minutes into this video, we're ready for chapter four, variables. We'll look at the difference between varlet and const and also figure out what hoisting means. Var allows you to initialize a variable, assign a value to it, and then also reassign a value to it later. Now, before you can really understand anything else about variables, you need to understand the execution context. And this simply refers to the way your code is being interpreted. Because your JavaScript program likely contains variables and functions defined all over the place, so the context defines the relationship between how your code is written to how it will be interpreted by the JavaScript engine. We can define a variable anywhere in our script, and that will be considered a global variable. In other words, it's available in the global execution context. That means if I have a function somewhere else in my code, I can still reference that variable. I like to think of global as an imaginary function that wraps my script. In other words, running a script is just like calling this imaginary global function. And that means if we define additional functions in our code, we have a different execution context for defining variables. For example, if we try to define a variable inside this function and then reference it in the global context, we'll get a reference error because the local variable is not available in this context. Now that's pretty straightforward, but there are a few pieces of weirdness that you need to be aware of. If you assign a value to an undeclared variable, which you should really never do, it will automatically be assigned as a global variable, even if it's done inside of an enclosing function. And the other thing you need to know about is hoisting, which applies to variables, but also function declarations as well. Now, whenever JavaScript processes an execution context, it will basically put all the variables at the top, or in other words, hoist them to the top of the context. That means if we initialize a variable down here at the bottom and then reference it somewhere higher up in the code, it will still be considered declared within this scope. But the actual assignment of a value will still happen wherever you define it in the code. So if you want to keep your sanity, it's always a good idea to declare your variables at the top of the context. But the bigger problem with var is that it becomes very hard to keep track of the scope of variables and there can be a lot of name collisions as your app grows more complex. Luckily, we no longer have to use var because in modern JavaScript, we have let and const. Let is similar to var in most ways, but it's limited to the scope of a block statement. That means if you define a variable inside of an if statement or a loop, it will be limited to that block. And this differs from var, which would leak out into the parent scope. And also like var, variables defined with let can be reassigned to different values later in the code. But in many cases, you'll have values that should never be reassigned. This makes it a lot more difficult to accidentally override values in your code. So when it comes to variables, a good rule to follow is to always use const unless you absolutely know that you'll override that value later, in which case you can use let. And you should respect the legacy of var, but just never use it. And with that, we're ready for chapter five, functions. Aren't you going to say hello? This course will have an entire video on functions, but there are a few basic things you should know. So let's start by answering the question of what is a function? And the answer is that it's simply a piece of code that takes an input and produces an output when it's called. You can use the function keyword as we're doing here, or you can use the more concise arrow syntax in modern JavaScript. If you omit braces, the code following the arrow will implicitly return a value, so you can define a function that returns something on a single line. But as easy as that sounds, there's all kinds of complexity and terminology that goes along with functions. 
So let's try to unpack some of the most important concepts that you should understand as a JS developer. First of all, functions can be anonymous or they can have a name which will immediately follow the function keyword. And you'll also commonly see anonymous functions assigned to the value of a variable. And another thing you'll hear is that JavaScript supports higher order functions. And that means we can provide functions as the input or arguments to another function or as the return value from a function. In the previous video, we talked about the JavaScript event loop and callbacks, and this is important with functions because you'll often use anonymous functions as arguments to other functions that will be called back later after some asynchronous code is finished executing. In addition, you can define new functions within a function. In this example, the outer function is the one that wraps the inner function. And that's related to a very important question that you'll hear in a lot of JavaScript interviews, what is a closure? In the most simple sense, a closure is just a function within a function, where the inner function references a variable that was declared in the scope of the outer function. Now what makes this special versus a lot of other programming languages is that the variable in the outer function will be maintained in memory even after that function returns and is popped off the call stack. So this means the inner function always has access to this state from the outer function at the time it was created. In the code here you can see we define a couple of variables in the outer function, then we operate on them and return them from the inner function, and then expose the inner function by simply returning it. And now because that outer function has closed over the inner function, we can call it and still have reference to the state in the outer function. Even though we only called the outer function once, we still have access to its local variables. And that's how you make a closure. If you have experience with an object-oriented programming language, a closure is very similar to a class instance, at least from a conceptual standpoint, because you have a function that contains some state, and then you have an inner function that can operate and change that state in the same way that a class instance has some properties and then you have methods that can change those properties. In fact, the class keyword in JavaScript is just syntactic sugar for functions and closures. But we'll look at classes and object-oriented programming in a future video. Because now we're ready for chapter six, objects. An object is just a data structure that allows you to associate a collection of key value pairs which is similar to a map or a hash map in other languages. It's possible to instantiate an object and then add properties to it one by one, but in most cases you'll use the object literal syntax. This allows you to define an object by simply enclosing your key value pairs inside of braces. You can access the value of a key by using dot notation or with brackets and a string. And you can mutate properties on an object even when it's defined as a const variable. And it's also important to point out that functions can be used as values on an object then inside a function, we can actually reference properties on this object by using this. But what the hell is this? This is one of the more challenging concepts to grasp in JavaScript. Now remember earlier, I said that anything that's not a primitive value is an object. And this is just a keyword that refers to the current object that the code is operating in. If you go into the browser console and say console like this, it's going to print out the window object. That's because window is the global scope in browsers. When referenced by itself, or if used in a function that's called normally, it will reference the global object. That's easy enough, but what if we have our own custom object, and on that object we have two properties that define functions. The first function uses the function keyword, but the second function uses the arrow syntax. Now intuitively you might think that these functions are exactly the same, but that's not the case. In the first function, this refers to the object that it's defined on. But when it comes to the arrow function, it doesn't have its own bindings to this, which means it bypasses our custom function and this becomes the global object. Now the other thing you should know is that when you have a function, there are other ways to call it beyond just using parentheses. For example, you can use its call method and then pass in the this context that you want to bind to the function. Now, any references that you have to this in the function will reference the object that you pass to call. In the code here, we're calling this face in the function, but it's currently bound to the global object, which doesn't have a face property. But if we pass in an object that does have a face property like a clown or a ghost, then it will return a defined value. Understanding this will make you a better JavaScript developer, but it won't be something that you have to use on a daily basis. And with that being said, I think we've covered enough information for one video. And don't worry too much if that felt overwhelming. We can't have anyone freak out out there, okay? We've got to keep our composure. We've come too far. There's too much to lose. We've got to keep our composure. We'll revisit many of these concepts when we look at the practical applications of functions, objects, and more. I'm going to go ahead and wrap things up there. If this video helped you, please like and subscribe, and make sure to check out the full source code on Fireship.io. Thanks for watching, and I will talk to you soon.